That's him! That's him! Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and with the recent announcement that Blade will be joining the MCU, and with the amazingly talented Maher Shala Ali announced to be taking on the role. Today, we'll be exploring the prodigious vampire hunter, going through his origins in the comics, and some of the changes made for the film trilogy starring Wesley Snipes. Created by Marv Wolfman and illustrated by Gene Colan as a supporting character in issue number 10 of The Tomb of Dracula, released in July of 1973, the hugely popular Blade would go on to star in his own comic book titles shortly thereafter. He's also appeared in the animated Spider-Man television series, and would, of course, make his first appearance in film with the Blade trilogy starring Wesley Snipes. I should also mention that the character had his own live-action television series starring Sticky Fingers, but we're not going to talk about that because... Well, because it's really bad. Formerly known as Eric Brooks, in the comics, Blade was born to Lucas and Tara Cross. Both his parents were members of a group called the Order of Tyrona, a secret organization that specialized in matters of the occult, and more specifically, vampires. Due to the dangers associated with their work, the pregnant Tara had been sent to England under the alias Vanessa Brooks, where she took up residence with Madame Vanity. A friend and fellow member of Tyrona, shortly before Lucas, who was dying of cancer, was captured and imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit in Latveria. Wanting to keep his birth a secret to protect the child, Tyra decided to give birth in Madame Vanity's brothel, but she began experiencing complications during labour, forcing her to seek out the assistance of the doctor. But when her friend called for one, the person who arrived was none other than Deacon Frost, a former scientist turned vampire who reached his lifelong goal of finding the key to immortality through vampirism. The ravenous vampire then began feasting on Tara as she gave birth, and because Eric was still attached to her via his umbilical cord, the enzymes from Frost entered his bloodstream, transforming him into a dampier, a half-human, half-vampire being that was tainted by vampirism, but not completely corrupted by it. Luckily for the baby, before Frost could feed on him, Madame Vanity and her employees were able to drive Frost away, leading to Brooks getting raised by his mother's friends. With a hybrid form of vampirism, Blade was in essence immune to future vampire bites, and while he possessed the strength of vampires, he, like them, was still allergic to sunlight, and it's not until his encounter with Morbius the living vampire down the track that his biochemical makeup would change forever, which I'll get into later in this video. I also think it's important to note that while Brooks grew up assuming his father had died long ago, Lucas was also bitten by a vampire while he was in prison. After breaking out, Lucas would later capture his son in the years that followed, and try to use him to fulfill a prophecy, similar to the actions of Deacon Frost in the first Blade film, who used Blade to enact the Lamagra ritual. While growing up in London, the then nine-year-old Eric came across Jamal Afari, a veteran vampire slayer that was being attacked by vampires, and he helped fend them off. After learning about the child's unique history, Afari decided to take him under his wing, becoming his mentor and foster father, where he used his years of experience to help the boy gain control of his powers and become a professional vampire hunter. Resolved to avenge his mother's death, Eric took the training with enthusiasm as a teenager and began calling himself Blade after the sharp weapons he would use to kill the vampires. Unfortunately for Blade, Dracula himself bit and infected Afari, and when he approached his foster father, Afari attacked him, unable to control his thirst for blood, forcing Blade to kill him in self-defense. This tragedy, along with the death of his mother, would prove to be the two most defining moments in his life, with Blade then dedicating every fibre of his being to finding and killing both Deacon Frost and Dracula for their actions. I'm sure you would have already noticed some similarities between the comics and the film trilogy, like how Deacon Frost was a person responsible for the creation of Blade, as well as the death of his mentor at the hands of vampires, though Jamal Afari was replaced by another character created for the films called Abraham Whistler. He was the first of his kind. The Patriarch of Hominus Nocturna. 
One of the biggest differences between the two would have to be the origin story of Dracula, who is explained as being the first vampire that was born roughly 6,000 years ago, while in the comics, Dracula was actually only 600 years old and had himself been turned into a vampire by a gypsy after being mortally wounded by a Turkish warlord. The other most notable difference between the comics and the film series would have to be the characterization of Blade, as in the comics, his dialogue, especially in the 80s and early 90s, was a cliched representation of African Americans. This began to change in the late 90s, especially with the release of the first Blade film, where Wesley Snipes gave the character a more intelligent, stoic, and grounded foundation. This celebrated portrayal of the character led to later publications following suit to match this more modern depiction of Blade, his first encounter with Dracula would come in issue number 10 of The Tomb of Dracula, when he and a group of vampire hunters consisting of Musenda, Orgi, Ogon, and Azu tricked Dracula into believing that they were interested in carrying out his bidding during the day while he slept. This of course was a trap used by the group to corner him, and by issue number 13, they were able to drive a stake into his heart. However, Dracula was eventually resurrected by servants in issue number 14, and carried out a vengeful attack against the vampire hunters, leaving only Musenda and Blade alive. The Daywalker would pursue Dracula over the years across Europe with the help of characters like Rachel Van Helsing, Quincy Parker, and Frank Drake, either killing him again only for him to be resurrected, or joining with him to fight mutual threats to both humanity and the entire vampire nation. By issue number 53 of the same comic series, Blade was able to get his revenge on Deacon Frost with the help of Hannibal King, a former detective turned vampire. The two of them were able to pursue Frost back to his lair, where Blade impaled the vampire in the chest with a few stakes, prior to the explosive destruction of his base of operations, which ended Frost for good. What I found most interesting when exploring his publication history was that, while in the films he was born with the ability to walk in daylight without injury, leading to his nickname the Daywalker, in the comics, Blade actually didn't develop this unique trait until much later in his career. This ability came about in the Adventure into Fear issue number 24, after Blade was bitten by Morbius the Living Vampire, a former Nobel Prize winning biochemist and notorious Spider-Man villain who'd himself inherited a unique form of the vampiric gene through an experimental accident that had gone awry. The combination of Blade's unique blood and the unique strain of vampirism possessed by Morbius transformed Blade into a vampire that was able to move about in sunlight. As a result of this new infection, he also became resistant to most traditional weaknesses of vampires, like their sensitivity to crosses and garlic. But the Daywalker was now also driven by an uncontrollable thirst for blood, which he was forced to hold back with a serum. As a Dampier, the human-vampire hybrid was resistant to aging, had supernatural strength, speed, agility, durability, senses, a prolonged lifespan, a regenerative healing factor, and immunity to traditional vampire vulnerabilities. In addition to all of this, Blade was a master martial artist, and he also had a deep understanding of sorcery and aspects of the supernatural, which has seen him team up with Doctor Strange on a few occasions. While his popularity as a character saw his integration into many of the Marvel story arcs, including the Marvel Avengers, Ghost Rider, Adventure into Fear, and the Tomb of Dracula, it wasn't until his appearances in the successful Night Stalker series, which saw him sporting a new look and more of that attitude we now love, that publishers decided to give him his own titles, beginning with Blade, the Vampire Hunter. Though most of his solo titles have scarcely reached over 10 issues, he's since been featured as a mainstay character in stories like the Civil War series, the Mighty Avengers, and more recently, the Secret Empire story arc. One of my favourite publications would have to be the Marvel Team-Up issue number 8, which sees both Blade and the Punisher joining forces to bring down gangsters and vampires. In it, we see Blade on a rooftop watching a deal go down below him. The Punisher then sneaks up behind him, and Blade explains that he smelt him from a mile away. The Daywalker then instructs him to put his gun down for two reasons, the first being that he would cut his throat before Frank Castle could pull the trigger, and the second, that it wouldn't even damage him anyway. As the Daywalker continues to observe the crime occurring below him, Castle puts a silencer on his pistol before shooting him in the back. While the pair ended up working together, this is hands down one of my favourite scenes featuring both characters, encapsulating their grit, mutual distrust of others, and inherent stubbornness. It's also important to note that both Blade and the Punisher had suffered great loss in their past, which had set them on the path they now were on, which, coupled with their indomitable will and sets of skills, made them a great crime-fighting duo. You know what draws your eye when you look at that? The crime. Wanna know why? Because everybody wants to be the king. 
While I'm thrilled to hear the phenomenal Mahershala Ali will be portraying Blade in the upcoming reboot, and I'm equally excited to see the character enter the ever-expanding Marvel Cinematic Universe. My main concern is Disney's PG-13 ratings for all the films we've seen in the series so far, and their reluctance to make R-rated films, which Blade will need to be for the film to do the character justice. Considering the colossal success of both Deadpool films by 20th Century Fox, which had R ratings, and the recent acquisition of Fox by Disney, which also owns Marvel, I'm hoping that Disney will go down the route of using Fox to distribute the film. This will essentially enable Disney to make the R rated version of Blade the character deserves without affecting their family friendly image. As for the upcoming film, I'm hoping we'll see Blade growing up in London under the tutelage of Jamal Afari before making his way to the US as he does in the comics. I also expect to see Deacon Frost playing a huge role in the series, but I hope they have Blade face off with Dracula first, since they can just revive him for later films if need be, leaving Frost as the ultimate villain that he pursues throughout the new trilogy, as he is, in essence, the catalyst for the metamorphosis of Brooks into Blade. It's a shame, you know? When I think of what you've become, what you should have become, I guess I don't blame you. I mean, with everything that's happened, it's the human side of you that's made you weak. Well, that's all for today, folks. Please let me know what other upcoming Marvel films you guys are looking forward to, and what your thoughts are on the Blade reboot as well. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.